Good evening and uh, welcome to this presentation. I want to begin by uh, thanking the Missouri History Museum and the Academy of Science for hosting it and then special thanks to Richard Spiner and to Tony Armstrong for a really remarkable interpretation of these wonderful areas, illustrating better than anybody could do in a congressional testimony one of the important values of wilderness, which is inspiration for artistic uh, aspirations. And you've definitely demonstrated that, ably uh, aided, by the way, by Jonathan Lehman's uh, very skilled uh, graphic depictions and uh, organization. <coughs> so thank you very much for that. I want, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to begin by uh, mentioning something that the program uh, this evening will not do. Uh, it will not articulate a defense of the importance of wilderness or any long, deeply involved descriptions of some of our areas. There will be a little bit of that. Uh, but mainly, I was asked to tell you the story of how these federally designated areas came to be protected and uh, came to be part of our national wilderness preservation system. Uh, going through these notes, which are about 30 years old, was interesting and moving for me. Um, and I found that it really is an interesting story. I think it is entirely appropriate that this be uh, looked at in a context, not only of the Academy of Science, but also of the Missouri History Museum. It was really a social movement and it really drew together a lot of powerful social forces uh, that had a, made a difference in our lives today. So I think it's worth doing, and um, I'm very much looking forward to sharing it with you. I do think it's helpful, though, to begin with a little bit of a background about what wilderness is. Uh, this is a word, wilderness, which has had a remarkable career in Western civilization. The concept goes back at least as far as the earliest uh, scriptures of, of the Old Testament. And in those writings, you will find that wilderness is a concept that's discussed. It's, it's part of the landscape of, of the imagination in that literature. Wilderness is a place of danger. It's a place of temptation. It has a lot of uh, risk associated with it, but it's also a place where in the solitude of the wilderness, one can pray more deeply and one can commune more directly with one's creator. That's a powerful dualistic concept, and I can assure you that the people who settled this country were deeply steeped in that literature. They were very powerfully influenced by that kind of, of concept. And throughout our history as a country, America's had this dual relationship with this concept of wildness and wilderness. On the one hand, it had to be defeated. It had to be conquered. It had to be civilized. But it also was the raw material out of which we created our wonderful country. It gave us a fresh spirit. So we had a tremendous, powerful uh, relationship with wilderness that was on the one part a challenge, but on the other part it was deeply rewarding and very important to our character as a, as a country. In our own language, the word wilderness has another important connotation, which has also been part of the history of the concept from the very beginning. The old English word, wildeor, W-I-L-D-E-O-R. It means the home of the wild beasts. So there's also a very important relationship to wildlife. And that's been part of the concept from the very beginning. As America developed, we did in fact conquer the wilderness. We did defeat it, uh, all but exterminate it. And as this began to be clear, people began to uh, uh, 
come to a sense of discomfort about the total elimination, the total destruction of all wilderness. And so as the American conservation ethic began to develop, yes, it included a very powerful in instinct, as it should, for wise utilization. But there was also, parallel to that, a, a, a consideration of the value of wild land, land that we did not control, we did not uh, utilize in, a, in a, a normal sense, but which was important to us as part of the geography of hope as it was expressed so eloquently by some early conservationists. Most importantly, it was recognized that this was part of the American character and we didn't want to lose all of it. The first real federal land system that recognized the concept, even though they didn't use the word and they had no system officially, was the national park idea. National parks clearly carved beautiful, stunning, scenic wilderness out of our national estate and protected it. But the concept of national parks had a, a very heavy influence also on, uh, was heavily influenced by the concept of the need to render those landscapes accessible and available for all kinds of recreational opportunities. The first agency that really developed the concept of wilderness as we know it today was not the Park Service, it was the National Forest Service. The National Forest Service consisted of huge acreages of land, primarily out west, but also in the east, where most of the utilization derived back to Gifford Pinchot and the concept of wise use, multiple uses, uh, cutting some timber, but doing it carefully, developing water resources, developing even mineral resources. However, there was uh, leadership in the Forest Service which recognized that these are all good things, but we don't want to exterminate the wilderness while we're doing it. What's left of the American wilderness deserved a place in the future of the national forests and not just their past. And one of the important people in that movement was a man who's had quite an influence on all of us, I, I presume, Aldo Leopold. The Forest Service, in fact, created a wilderness system. Uh, it was an administrative system. The uh, Secretary of Agriculture could create one, but what Congress and conservationists began to realize as time went on and different things happened to uh, challenge the integrity of that administrative wilderness system was that by the same stroke of a pen, the sec Secretary of Agriculture could undo the wilderness or redraw the boundary or provide a waiver for the cutting of some timber or the development of some mineral resource. And so there began to be a, a, a powerful movement in the 30s, 40s, and 50s to create a different kind of wilderness system, one that would be more permanent, maybe harder for the areas to get into the system, but much harder for the areas to get out of the system. That movement resulted in 1964 in the passage of the Wilderness Act. And it was a uh, part of the great wave of conservation legislation in the 1960s, signed by President Johnson. With the Wilderness Act, wilderness acquired something else. It acquired We've talked about the definition of wilderness, a new definition, this time a legal definition. And I'll, I'll quote from the Wilderness Act. Wilderness is an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. Further, it speaks of the fact that it's undeveloped federal land affected primarily by the forces of nature with outstanding opportunities for solitude, and generally at least 5,000 acres to ensure that it was always connected to a sense of spaciousness, which is very critical to the concept of wilderness. Well, in this talk tonight, we're gonna to be talking mostly about wilderness in that sense, the statutory legal definition of wilderness as a unit of a federal wilderness system. And this wilderness system was conceived by Congress as being applicable all across the different federal systems, uh, selected choice portions of different uh, uh, units of federal land could be designated as wilderness. In other words, a portion of Rocky Mountain National Park, the wildest part, that could be designated as wilderness. Uh, portions of the national forests could be designated as wilderness. Not the entire forest, but the, the wild portions, the select choice remnants of America's wild heritage. Also, portions of 
national wildlife refuges administered by the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, even portions of Bureau of Land Management land, which generally tend to be more heavily uh, commercially developed, portions of them could also be designated as wilderness. So what we have is a system, a wilderness system, which kind of cuts across other federal land designations and creates uh, a sort of a special designation administered by various different uh, agencies, but all of which have as their highest goal the protection of those very special qualities, which render them of eternal value to us as an American people. I like to think of it as a Congress and the country really deciding that part of our national purpose would be that we should always have at least some remnant of land where we do not dominate, manipulate, or improve, but rather we visit to learn, enjoy, and reflect. One of the important things about the fact that it was a legislative system meant that it was harder to undo them. The other side of that is that it was also harder to get them designated. The Secretary of Agriculture or the Secretary of Interior couldn't designate them with a stroke of his pen. It took an act of Congress. Now this was a trade-off at the time, but what it turned out doing is making it imperative that wilderness was a result of a political consensus. It meant that wilderness people who cared about these places had to get organized politically and had to work with their legislatures and with their uh, congressional delegations. Uh, we learned this in a very powerful way shortly after the wilderness thing got going. Uh, without which, you can't get the designation. This was a hurdle, but it also was a great source of strength uh, for uh, the conservation movement and for the wilderness system. It meant that no wilderness is in there by accident. No wilderness is in there because somebody was in the mood one day to designate it. It has to go through a deliberate process. And that has made it a very strong system and one that at 50 years of age, I think, is looking very good and hopefully will continue uh, to serve this country. Because of the designation process, citizens had to mobilize. The first places they looked, of course, was to the areas that had already been designated as part of the uh, Forest Service Wilderness System administratively. Naturally enough, almost all those areas were out in the great American Mountain West. Fantastic areas, obviously scenic, obviously wild, but it didn't represent the whole country. Uh, there began to be a realization that if this was going to be a system that represented what was important about the wildness of our country, it needed to include representative samples of all the different landscapes in the country, not only in the uh, west, but also in the east and in the south. And that led, shortly after the Wilderness Bill passed, and these early designations uh, were incorporated, toward a movement for protection of wilderness areas in the east. And that meant that we had to kind of uh, work on how were we going to define what could be a wilderness. There were very few areas that were totally pristine, but there were a lot of areas that had achieved a wildness since their desert. Most of the national forests in the east were uh, purchased and designate, uh, identified in the 1930s. And there were on those areas, there were a number of, of opportunities for genuine wildness that could be protected in the east and in the south. When they looked east and south, that included mostly national forest land. There were some very wonderful uh, wilderness areas on National Wildlife Refuge. Okefenokee Swamp is probably the biggest but in the east, but also um, uh, most of the areas were on the national forest. And what this meant in Missouri, of course, was the Mark Twain National Forest. The Mark Twain, which at the time that this began, there were two national forests, some of you recall that, the Clark National Forest and the Mark Twain. They were later united in one. But with, together, the Mark Twain National, the combined Mark Twain National Forest, as it, as it exists today, is a wonderful forest. It includes one and a half million acres of land. A lot of it is roaded, a lot of it is utilized for uh, timber harvest, and that's not all bad. Uh, in fact, it's, some of us would argue that th th that's a part of a balanced <laughs> use. But there were areas on that Mark Twain National Forest that were genuinely remote, genuinely beautiful, genuinely wild, and Somebody had to speak up for them. That's where we come to the Missouri story. I'm going to just say a word or two about what happened in Missouri in regard to the concept of wildness. 
before the passage of the 1964 Act. The earliest recorded uh, English language speaking and writing explorer who talked about Missouri's wilderness in its more or less original condition uh, was Henry Rowe Schoolcraft, who traveled across the Ozarks looking primarily for mineral resources, uh, but a very uh, intelligent man and a, a vigorous explorer uh, in 1818 and 1819. And he wrote about the, the, the beauty, it was really truly impressed him. And uh, subsequently, there was a very intrepid and uh, remarkable, strong character a gentleman from Ireland who was a Roman Catholic priest named Father John Joseph Hogan. And uh, Father Hogan uh, led a group of his countrymen who were languishing in uh, poor circumstances here in St. Louis. Uh, he wanted to get them back on the land. And so he explored the opportunities for purchasing land in the Ozarks for these people. And he settled on an area that subsequently became known as the Irish Wilderness. And uh, no one has ever described Missouri or Ozark wilderness more eloquently, in my opinion, uh, than uh, Father Hogan, who in his memoirs, he later became the Bishop of Kansas City. Uh, in his memoirs, he described the, the, the setting in which he was trying to settle these Irish uh, immigrants. Uh, and his words were, the place seemed to inspire devotion. Nowhere could the human soul so profoundly worship as in the depths of that leafy forest, beneath the swaying branches of the lofty oaks and pines, where solitude in the heart of man united in praise and wonder of the great creator. <laughs> well, when we had the uh, uh, hearings in Congress on the Irish wilderness, uh, Senator Danforth asked the president of the ancient order of Hibernians in America to read that passage, and uh, he choked up while he was reading it. Uh, it really has a power. It had power then, and it has power today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Aldo Leopold, uh, uh, best known for his uh, connections uh, to the upper uh, Midwest and the Great Lakes country, especially Wisconsin, uh, not everybody knows he had connections here in Missouri. He explored some of these areas, and he talked about the Irish wilderness as well. And he recommended that it be part of the wilderness system. This is back in the 1930s uh, uh, when they were first setting up the Mark Twain National Forest. In the 1940s, we had a wonderful outdoor writer. Uh, we don't seem to have those in our papers these days, but Leonard Hall, many of you remember Leonard Hall, a uh, great conservationist. He wrote uh, eloquently about the Irish wilderness in a national publication called The Living Wilderness of the Wilderness Society. And he also proposed a 100,000 acre wilderness area in the uh, St. Francis Mountains called the Tom Sauk Wilderness. Parts of that have been included in the subsequent wilderness designations. And finally, in the 1950s, a wonderful writer for the Conservation Department, Dan Salt, uh, wrote very powerfully about the, the space and breadth and clean loneliness of the Irish wilderness. Well, again, that's, that, those, those writers really understood. So there was this awareness of these areas and of their value even before the passage of the Wilderness Act. After 1964 uh, and the beginning of a consciousness of the importance of designated, designating areas in the East, uh, the first organization that stood, stepped up and said uh, something about this was the Missouri Conservation Federation. Uh, which is a, an affiliate of the National Wildlife Federation. And they passed a powerful resolution uh, requesting that Forest Service set these areas aside and that Congress uh, enact legislation to have them designated. And as early as 1971 and 1972, the Forest Service uh, cooperated with that. They identified about seven areas, not for wilderness designation, but for what they prefer. They had an alternative idea, but it was related and it was sympathetic and complementary to create an, a, a system called Eastern Wild Areas. They were concerned that if these areas that had once uh, had some uh, influence of man on them, but had recovered wildness, that that would open too many floodgates for the designation of Western wilderness areas. And so they preferred a different separate system. Congress in the end rejected that idea and um, 
went forward with designating these eastern areas as units of the one single national wilderness preservation system. And then finally, the uh, national conservation organizations put together a bill. Uh, still remember the name, or the number, Senate Bill 316. And uh, Senator Tom Eagleton co-sponsored it. Well, those of us who were interested in this, this was in 1973, thought, well, this is easy. Uh, no problem here. Uh, it included the Irish Wilderness and a, a few others. Uh, it was called the Eastern Wilderness Act. Uh, however, it was mostly with the input of the Forest Service. Conservationists weren't organized. Uh, there was that resolution from the Conservation Federation, but there was no real conservation effort to stand up and, and we just thought, well, this is great. It was introduced and passed and then we'll have these areas. Didn't work that way. When that bill passed the Senate, it went over to the House of Representatives and the chairman of the relevant committee hearing that uh, legislation was a, a gentleman from the state of Montana named John Melcher. And John was uh, uh, from the state of Montana, as I say, and he had some misgivings about wilderness areas because in his state, they have huge wilderness areas. And he, he thought, well, I don't know, this might not be such a great idea. I'm gonna ask the, the congressmen who represent each one of these areas, uh, what they think, which seems reasonable enough, except those congressmen were Dick Icor, Gene Taylor, and Bill Burleson. And uh, <laughs> God bless them. Uh, I think they're all past their eternal reward now. But they didn't think this was a great idea. But why did they not think this was a great idea? We hadn't talked to them. Nobody had approached them. They didn't have constituents who were telling them they thought these areas ought to be protected. So every one of those guys represented one, of these, one or more of these areas, and they said no. So John Melcher took them out of the bill. When that happened, the, it didn't uh, stop the Eastern Wilderness Act. It went forward. And by the way, we weren't the only state who had this rude awakening. There were a number of others that did too. But there was an Eastern Wilderness Act. It did pass, and there were some, all of a sudden, a lot of areas in the Eastern United States designated as wilderness but nothing from Missouri. And we were, <laughs> it was a hard lesson. Uh, but I'll tell you something. It was the most important moment in the history of the Missouri Wilderness Campaign. Um, we came to a very clear understanding that wilderness is an act of the people. It requires local support. Uh, it requires the mobilization of citizens. And it re <clears throat> requires a campaign and uh, out of this uh, realization was born this new organization, very informal but very energetic, called the Missouri Wilderness Coalition. And this uh, organization was really just an alliance of a whole lot of different organizations. Uh, its key was that it was statewide. It was organized in every congressional district. In those days, by the way, we had 10 <laughs> congressional districts. Um, it's, Main emphasis was on frequent and good communication among the members and the affiliates. I would say this, that it was also founded on a concept of respect for each other. It was also founded on respect for local opinion because without local support or at least acceptance, the local congressman was not going to allow this to happen in his district. And it was based on respect for every member of our Missouri delegation. They are the elected representatives of our people, and we had to respect that, and we had to work with them. And if we didn't, we weren't gonna get anywhere. We utilized a lot of different organizations, and I, I'm, I'm gonna try to avoid during this presentation mentioning a lot of names and a lot of specific organizations, but I think it's useful for you to know that uh, we utilized existing organizations and their uh, regional structures. For example, Audubon Society has chapters all over the state, including chapters in every congressional district. Sierra Club had regional groups, more or less all across the state. Uh, the Conservation Federation had dozens and dozens of affiliates, including every, practically every county uh, in the state. And the Ozark Society had chapters as well. And we utilized those as sort of a framework for working together, staying in touch. There were frequent newsletters. Um, 
and we developed our message. And our message was that wilderness was a good thing, it was good for this state, and it wasn't gonna interfere with anybody else's utilization of the National Forest because we weren't talking about that much land uh, uh, by comparison to the one and a half million acres of Mark Twain. And then we learned how to deliver that message. Uh, by today's standards, our tools were very primitive, uh, but we utilized them and we had a lot of fun doing it. And that included slideshows, photo exhibits, not as elegant as the one we have here uh, uh, tonight, but uh, you know, effective. Calendars, fact sheets, tabloids. In fact, you've got a tabloid here. It's a little bit later vintage, it's 2007, but it, it's a, this is a, uh, uh, comes at the end of a long line of similar type uh, publications. Brochures uh, and uh, time on the ro uh, radio, etc. The key thing though, was that we, knew we had to sit down and talk to the people who lived around these areas. We had to convince them that this was not something that was gonna bother them or hurt them or interfere with their ability to use and enjoy the national forest. We also met with, and that, that, was, a, that was a stimulating and revelatory experience for all of us. Um, and we also met with the Forest Service. And we met with every member of our Missouri delegation, both senators and all 10 congressmen. And our governor, uh, Christopher Bond, who was a, ended up being very helpful to us in a number of key ways uh, throughout the campaign. And then in 1976, uh, we had a sort of a, a forced marriage uh, with our Missouri General Assembly because the Missouri Forest Products Association, which saw that they were losing ground in the congressional delegation, decided they would come in around and, and torpedo this movement by uh, convincing their friends in the Missouri General Assembly to oppose wilderness by a resolution of the Missouri House of Representatives, H.R. 110. Some of you will remember that little ferocious campaign, which we won because we, it forced us to get down to Jefferson City and talk to the uh, legislators. We, it ended up we were a lot of friends in the Missouri General Assembly, and H.R. 110 was tabled. Uh, but that was good for us because it got us in touch with these people. Uh, we can't win a political uh, campaign by being too good to talk to our elected officials. If there's a single thing that uh, I took out, took away from that overall experience, that was it. You have to talk to these people. And there's a reason why they've been elected, because they're not easy to talk to uh, in some circle or another. We might not be part of that circle, but we can, we can communicate with them. And uh, that was our experience. And, uh, uh, it was a very gratifying one. Finally, in May of 1976, the first major Ozark Wilderness Conference was held in uh, Montauk State Park. And that was the official birth of the Missouri Wilderness Coalition. In July of that year, uh, uh, legislation was heard in the Senate and in the House. And finally, in October 19th, uh, Public Law 94-557 was passed, and that was the first designation of any Missouri wilderness areas. It included two, uh, uh, one national forest area, Hercules Glades, and then one which was a unit of the National uh, Wildlife Refuge System, a portion of Mingo National Wildlife Refuge. That's a, an illustration of Hercules Glades, and you can find out all about it in Richard and Tony's beautiful exhibit, but this is sort of a snapshot. It gives you an idea. It's open country down in the southwestern Ozarks. Wonderful place, expansive vistas, really a sense of freedom and openness that is essential to the wilderness concept. <clears throat> and uh, Mingo is unique in a completely different and wonderful way. It's, a, it's one of the last really important remnants of, of what was left of our old uh, Mississippi floodplain down in southeastern Missouri. Uh, an extremely rich ecosystem and with a scenery and a power and a magic all of its own. And uh, fortunately, we do have this one sizable piece of it left and it is a, a, an exquisite place. Now, in addition to those two areas, there were also four areas that were designated as wilderness study areas. Bell Mountain, Rock Pile Mountain, Paddy Creek, and Piney Creek. And we will look at those later as we go through the uh, uh, process of how these different pieces of legislation
pass. So this, anyway, was our first major victory. But the campaign really was just underway. In November of that same year, uh, there were national elections. Two things happened in that national election. One, a new president, Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter was a conservationist, and he instituted a very important program which became instrumental in the, in the sort of framing of the wilderness campaign. The other thing was that we had a new senator elected, Jack Danforth. Now, we'd already had a strong wilderness advocate with uh, Senator Eagleton, and Senator Symington had also been helpful as well. But with Jack Danforth, who was a strong supporter, and Tom Eagleton, also a strong supporter, we were able to work both sides of the Senate, and that made a tremendous difference to us. And uh, this is another thing I learned in this. You have to be bipartisan in these things uh, if you expect to get a consensus uh, out of the Congress. So anyway, as I say, President Carter started a new uh, evaluation of all the national forest lands in the country called Roadless Area Review and Evaluation Two. Roman numeral two, because there had been an early one, earlier one that didn't work very well. Uh, so this was called R RARE, was the acronym, RARE two. Well, that became the framework under which we, as Missouri conservationists, decided we would go through and evaluate the lands of the Mark Twain National Forest and see what of those lands qualified for these uh, considerations and how would we to go about representing and, and protecting them. So this meant we organized teams of people, teams that went out into the field and researched uh, these areas. They explored the forest, uh, they read the criteria, and uh, then they met over kitchen tables and with maps and, and argued about boundaries. And uh, through this entire uh, process, MWC, or the Missouri Wilderness Coalition, really started to grow. It, it got more affiliates, it got more experience, it got more knowledge and it got more recognition as the spokesperson for the campaign. Eventually, if you count the memberships of the different organizations that were affiliated with the Missouri Wilderness Coalition, there were over 40,000 Missourians connected to our campaign. Uh, finally, by 1978, uh, it's just fact, the Missouri Wilderness Coalition knew more about the Mark Twain than the National Forest Service did. Uh, we had had people all over the forest looking, where, where's the power line? Where does that road go? What does this little dam mean? Et cetera, et cetera. Fences and everything else. We knew the forest. And our teams collectively, I should say, knew that forest. And uh, so in June of 17, uh, June 17th of that year, 1978, we had a wilderness summit where all of these teams came together. All of our affiliates gathered, again, at Montauk State Park. And these teams reported their findings. And we had uh, bad news. The bad news is there wasn't much wilderness left on the Mark Twain National Forest in Missouri. But we also had some good news. And that good news was there was some wilderness. And there wasn't a lot of it, but it was gorgeous, it was important, it was worth saving, and it was worth fighting for. And that's what grew, uh, drew this uh, a group of people together in a remarkable uh, way. Uh, we reviewed the criteria of the rare two programs and we evaluated our priorities and we had endless discussions but at the end of that conference we had all reached a very firm consensus and that consensus was that there were 14 areas on the Mark Twain National Forest that qualified or at least had important wilderness values that needed to be protected. That totaled about 120,000 acres which was only about 7.5% of the Mark Twain National Forest uh, out of 1.4 uh, million. Plus there was Mingo, which had already been designated, and plus there was part of Big Spring, which was partly on Forest Service land, but it was also partly on National Park Service land as part of the Ozark National Scenic Riverways. So, of those 14 areas, six were ready for designation and seven were uh, important enough that we knew they had wilderness values, and make, but they needed further study on their boundaries and what have you. So that was undertaken. Uh, that consensus became the Missouri Wilderness Coalition agenda for 1978. It was the Missouri Wilderness Coalition's agenda then. It continues to be the Missouri Wilderness Coalition agenda. Uh, and we're still working on it. Uh, in Rare 2, uh, we 
to summarize, we were forced to organize ourselves, we were forced to study the forest and to learn about it, and we were forced to prioritize. Uh, the key uh, uh, was rare too. It really helped get us going. And I'll say another thing. We discovered that we had tapped into some pretty powerful forces. Uh, it was a remarkable experience in a lot of ways, but I think the most powerful force that we tapped into was uh, the affection of our volunteers. Uh, the affection they had for each other and the respect they had for each other and also the affection and respect they developed for their home state of Missouri. I think a lot of Missourians didn't really deeply appreciate their own landscapes and I think that that changed in the Rare Two campaign. These people came back from those uh, field trips and those surveys and those camping trips and those canoe trips and they were on fire with the value and the beauty of those places and they wanted to do something to save them. And that was the most rewarding aspect of it in, in a lot of ways. Anyway, the campaigns got underway. As I said, everyone was bipartisan. Um, we had strong connections to every office in the Missouri delegation. We began to lose congressmen about this time. Uh, but we, were, we crossed over that urban-rural divide, that horrible thing that has ruined so many uh, political campaigns and uh, uh, conservation uh, projects, I think, in Missouri. And we crossed over the Republican and Democratic divide as well. What were the results? Well, in 1980, uh, we had a bill pass that designated four new wilderness areas. Bell Mountain, wonderful area in Iron County and the St. Francis Range. Look at that spectacular scenery. People don't even realize that we've got that kind of scenery. Rockpile Mountain, a smaller but wonderful area in Madison County on the St. Francis River. Uh, Piney Creek, one of the most rugged, beautiful areas down in southwestern Missouri. It's not far from Table Rock Lake. And uh, finally, uh, Devil's Backbone. This is the North Fork River that flows through the Devil's Backbone. It's one of the only wilderness areas, in, well, it's the only designated wilderness area right now where you've got a river flowing. We have a number of areas that flow alongside, or uh, rivers flow alongside of them, but this, the North Fork flows right through the Devil's Backbone wilderness area. So this was a great uh, 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 celebration. And by the way, in that same year, uh, this Missouri Department of Natural Resources designated eight areas as state wild areas. Now this is an earlier concept, it's an administrative system, but it was a wonderful thing and it helped to protect some of the wild areas on our state parks. Uh, and that's a sort of a separate story, but uh, a, a very good one. Well, after this bill passed, we had another conference to decide what we were gonna do with the rest of these areas, and that was in 1981. That was in Columbia, Missouri, at the Tiger Hotel. Many of us who were there remember an uh, inspiring speech we heard from David Brower, who was one of the great conservationists of the 20th century. He came and he gave a wonderful talk. And shortly thereafter, a bill was introduced to designate this extraordinary area called Patty Creek. It's in Texas County, and it's just very close to the uh, Big Piney River, and this beautiful stream flows right through it. Guess who introduced that bill? Representative Wendell Bailey, conservative Republican from Willow Springs. And he did it with the support of the entire Missouri delegation. And then, finally, <laughs> the Irish Wilderness, which could be a talk of its own. We won't uh, give you the, the, the gory details, but this was the largest area. It was the best known area. It was, however, the hardest of all the areas to designate because in this area we never did gain the support of the local congressman who was Bill Emerson. But it was so important and he, but he was, he, he was really concerned about the loss of the opportunity to mine in that area. Uh, but we decided it was also the most important wilderness area in the state. It had the most history, it was the largest, and therefore we weren't going to give it up and we were going to fight for it. Well, at the end of this bruising battle, uh, a staff person for the National um, Sierra Club in Washington, D.C. His name was Tim Mahoney. He used to like to wear his Irish harp tie when he went to hearings on the Irish wilderness. He said that, um, I want you to know, uh, uh, you Missourians, that never has the Sierra Club spent this much time and effort per acre on a wilderness designation as we have spent on the Irish wilderness. Uh, but it, in the end, it was passed, again, co-sponsored by Senator Eagleton and Danforth, uh, and co-sponsored in the House by uh, Harold Volkmer, conservative Democratic uh, congressman from Northeast Missouri, and signed by uh, two Irishmen, 
uh, in the end, President Ronald Reagan and the Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill. So that happened in 1984. Then in 1985, we still had those seven areas uh, that had not been dealt with. Uh, and there was a new forest plan coming on that we had to uh, uh, deal with. And how is this new forest plan for the Mark Twain going to treat those areas? Well, it turned out it didn't treat them very well. We had to appeal the plan, and there's a process whereby you can do that uh, with federal agencies. And uh, in the end, after a long story, in 1987, we signed a settlement agreement with the uh, uh, U.S. Forest Service that these areas, these seven endangered areas, as we call them, uh, sensitive areas, as they call them, uh, would be protected administratively, not the congressional designation, but protected, taken out of the timber base, no roads to be constructed, no mining to be uh, conducted. And so that uh, resulted in this other uh, uh, phase of our wilderness campaign, uh, whereby these seven endangered areas are these seven sensitive areas, and we've been engaged in that ever since, protecting them administratively until such time as Congress can see itself clear to, to act to protect them. Uh, very quickly, these are Lower Rock Creek uh, in Madison and Iron Counties. Really a gem, it's the second largest of our wilderness areas, 13,000 acres. This exquisite area, Swan Creek, uh, uh, down in Christian County. That's a, a cave in the North Fork area, uh, just north of the Devil's Backbone, also on the North Fork River. This is the only area north of the Missouri River. It's in the Cedar Creek unit of the Mark Twain National Forest. It's right between Columbia, Jefferson City, and Fulton. Uh, and yet it's a gem. It's only 2,000 acres, but it has a genuine wild quality about it. And we've recently had help from uh, Congressman Blaine Luchtemeyer in preventing a new road going through this area. So again, we're still in the business of, of protecting them. This is uh, another wonderful area near Willow Springs called Spring Creek. Uh, this is another area in the St. Francis Range called Van East Mountain. And then finally, a special area, I think, for many of us, uh, the only area in the current River Hills uh, that's designated uh, or ha has been proposed for wilderness, and that is the uh, uh, Big Spring area uh, down near Van Buren. And it's uh, uh, adjacent to the wonderful you know, attractions of Big Spring State Park in the hinterland of that park and the adjacent Forest Service property. Its total is about 8,000 acres. Uh, but it is an extraordinary area, beautiful pine trees, and uh, a real expanse of, of wildland. So this became what we, our agenda to protect these areas through the different uh, uh, Mark Twain National Forest plans. There was another plan developed in 2005. We didn't think it was good enough uh, protection. And so uh, at, in the way, aftermath of that plan, we uh, developed a, uh, another proposal uh, to get these areas designated uh, by Congress, not just protected administratively. And uh, the little tabloid you have here was developed in conjunction with that announcement. And it tells, I think, a, a, a very good story, and it's still current information about uh, how to, uh, or, or why these areas are important and uh, why they should be preserved. Now, I will say that even though these seven areas haven't been designated, we have been successful in protecting them. There have been no timber sales in them. There have been no roads developed, no dams built, no mining done. Uh, so th they are being protected administratively. That's not good enough. We eventually want them in the system. But it's not as if that has uh, been a failure uh, of protection because by working with the Forest Service, we've had pretty good protection. We do think in the end they need the protection of the legislative act. When we made this announcement, however, we discovered that the uh, political situation in our beautiful state had changed considerably since the 1970s and 80s. Uh, for one thing, and I'll, I say this uh, with, uh, you know, complete understanding, but nevertheless, it's a, it's, it's a sad fact. Public land uh, is less of a priority for many conservationists today than it, than it once was. Other issues have taken over our attention, uh, understandably, but it's had an impact on the ability to preserve wilderness areas. Also, conservation politics has become terribly polarized, a very disappointing uh, reality, but it's there. There's less communication, 
between ur urban and rural constituencies. There's certainly less uh, communication in our observation between Democratic and Republican uh, political people. Um, however, wilderness remains a wonderful thing. And it is uh, only necessary to look at the designated areas to be reminded of that. All the things that the Missouri Forest Products Association and the Missouri Mining Council said were going to happen to the economy of the Ozarks because of them have absolutely not happened. In fact, the Forest Service itself calculates two and a half million dollars annually in economic benefit to local economies and areas because of the wilderness areas. And so even on an economic basis, these have been a wonderful enrichment of our state, uh, not to mention their scientific value, their spiritual value, their recreational value, and as we see here this evening uh, in that beautiful display, their artistic value as an inspiration. So, in conclusion, I just want to uh, report to you that it is our hope that we can hold these wonderful areas, the designated and the proposed uh, places, uh, close to our hearts. Uh, that this upcoming anniversary of the Wilderness Act will encourage us uh, as Missourians to visit them, to enjoy them, and to cherish them. Uh, over time, I think that we can build another wave of public mobilization that again is based on mutual respect and willingness to listen to others and with some political skill lead us to a mutual understanding and a consensus that these areas indeed should and can be protected and designated as enduring units of the National Wilderness Preservation System. Thank you very much. I was told there might be an opportunity for questions. It's already 8 o'clock, but I'll do whatever you want. So, are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. The answer to the question, do these areas allow hunting and fishing? The answer is yes, where hunting and fishing was allowed prior to the designation. In other words, on a national forest area like the Irish wilderness, hunting and fishing was allowed prior to the designation. It continues to be, hunting and fishing is considered to be, even trapping is considered to be part of the way Americans interact with wild land. So that's, however, if it's, designated as a portion of a national park, which was a, which was a refuge, it doesn't open it up to hunting and fishing. In other words, it's sort of neutral on that subject, but where uh, hunting and fishing was previously allowed, it continues. In fact, one of our strongest uh, 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 affiliates was the uh, Missouri chapter of the National Wild Turkey Federation, because turkey hunters in particular seem to appreciate sort of the wild environment of pursuing their hunting, and, and also fishermen, trout fishermen and others, find that this is very compatible with their experience of, of, of the wild landscape, is to be able to go in a place and know that they're not gonna be run over by an off-road vehicle, because the off-road vehicles are not allowed. Yes, ma'am? Oh, oh, DNR? Uh, D DNR is not officially uh, involved in these. They are involved in the state uh, park wild areas, but not in federal. Are there any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, hi, John. Thanks for the lecture. This, I learned a lot. Um, this is more maybe an announcement than a question, but my understanding is that the National Park Service is going to hold a hearing in St. Louis on December 11th on the Big Spring Wilderness Area designation. And right. The time and place is not set yet, but I'd ask people in this audience who want to continue the good work that John's been talking about to pencil in December 11th on their calendar. There's going to be a hearing on that day here in St. Louis that the National Park Service is holding. There's going to be a hearing the day before, December 10th, in Van Buren, Missouri. 
So if you know folks in that area who could attend that meeting, that would also be very important because I think these seven additional areas that John talked about that don't have wilderness protection yet, we should uh, finish the unfinished business of the Missouri Wilderness Campaign. Amen, and that would be the, a, a way to begin. Uh, bear in mind that the National Park Service cannot designate the, uh, the Big Spring Wilderness. They can, however, protect it uh, in such a way that the wilderness values of the area can be maintained until such time as we are able to build the political consensus that we need. It seems a long way away in today's times, but I know that it's possible because we've done it that will eventually uh, arrive and allow that area to be included in the National Wilderness Preservation System. So our argument isn't to get the National Park Service to designate it, but to protect it so that Congress can make the, de the decision on designating it. And I think another part of that would be to go down and make sure that we've talked to the people in Carter County about it too. It, does, it wouldn't hurt a thing in Carter County. It would add value and it would add more appeal, more attraction, it would help the, the economy of Van Buren, uh, and that's the message we have to understand, craft, and deliver. And not just in St. Louis, we have to begin here, but all across uh, the state, especially in the local area. Yes, sir? John, you mentioned the- Trick question, I bet. <laughs> you mentioned the help that Senator Eagleton and Senator Danforth gave. I remember those days that it was sort of a five on two front, so naturally the wilderness areas and Environment dam issue, which was almost concurrent with you know, the development of uh, getting going through the Wilderness Act. And Senator Eagleton and Senator Danforth were really helpful there, and I know you got involved in, in that also. Well, there's some battle scarred veterans of both of those campaigns in the room this evening, and uh, we're delighted that they're here. And yes, they were. They were, they were exciting times, I have to say. <laughs> Carol Springer's here. She was one of the leaders in the fight to save the Merrimack River from being dammed into oblivion. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering when you're talking to local landowners, um, how much are you just working with them directly, or do you work through farm bureaus, or you know, what sort of method did you use to get your message out? And also, one of the issues I think is that there aren't good studies or more current studies about the benefits of wilderness, economic or recreational, etc. I'm sure that's true. I, it's been quiet. My hope is that this, this anniversary will help reinvigorate uh, more attention to those kinds of issues that you described. But to, to answer your first question, we, f we started with the people. We, we, we went around and talked to the neighbors. Um, Betty Campbell uh, around Bell Mountain, Poncho Elliott around uh, Patty Creek. And we found out that many of them had a very tight network of people with whom they worked in their local area. And these people tend to be connected to their elected officials at the state legislature and even in Congress. And that if we could get the, and make, we made friends, I, we still are friends with these people. And those people, uh, for example, Betty was uh, an officer in the Belt Mountain Mineral Area Heritage Association. That sounded like an organization formed to fight the designation of the Belt Mountain Wilderness, and it in part was. What we found out is that we were kindred spirits. They wanted the same thing out of the National Forest that we did. And uh, so we were able to work with those people. That's how we did it. We started with the actual human beings. And then that brought us into connection with local landowner organizations and other you know, civic groups, uh, Fredericktown uh, Kiwanis Club, for example, and others. Yes? Uh, the State Conservation Department uh, has no jurisdiction, in my knowledge, over national parks. 
That's, that's a function of the National Park Service, which is a federal agency in the Department of Interior. However, the Conservation Department um, owns a lot of land, about 800, I don't know how much, some, something over 700,000 acres. It, they've been, you know, since the parks, uh, the, their uh, sales tax has been passed, they've bought more. I don't know the current total, but it's a lot. And, but those are mostly state conservation areas, state wildlife areas. It does not include state parks, which are run by the Department of Natural Resources. It certainly does not include federal areas. However, on some federal lands, such as the Corps of Engineers reservoirs, they do sort of lease land and manage some of the habitat for wildlife. So I guess it can be a little bit confusing. Um, and like I say, uh, it's, it's fun to learn about. And once you learn how these things are organized, it helps us to have a base of knowledge which allows us to in ultimately influence the decisions that are made about these uh, wonderful areas. And if you want to have an influence over the decision, you have to know what you're talking about. One of the most important things about the, concert, uh, the Missouri Wilderness Coalition, in my opinion, was we, we kept our word, we never exaggerated, we never misrepresented, and ultimately, over several years, we had credibility with the delegation. Even those who were not sympathetic for, to our cause, they knew we would not misrepresent anything to them, and we didn't, and that was a huge asset. We never even exaggerated. And uh, that, was a, that was one of our most important assets in working with the congressional delegation. So, I don't see any more hands, Mr. Hall. Right now, with the government's recent shutdown, the only places you couldn't go to were the places that the national government was involved. So that's when the Kurt River was shut down and the North Fork River was shut down and so many other areas. I think that right now, people might be hesitant to have more national uh, control. Well, remember this. None of these areas would, are, are areas that would be purchased or bought to make them federal areas. These are areas that already federal property. And this is just a way of protecting, actually limiting the federal government's capacity to mess them up. Uh, the designation of wilderness only pro, uh, doesn't, you, you, you don't buy land with a wilderness designation. You take areas that are already federal property and you protect them from abuse by uh, the federal agency or anybody else. That's a good argument. And it's one that we made from time to time to, with people who were not necessarily all that keen on a lot of federal property in their county. It actually limited the damage that could be done to that property by the agency or by, you know, commercial exploiters. Well, it's uh, great fun to see you. And <laughs>